three minutes. The last afterward was in 1993. Uh, I was trying to figure out what has happened. And one thing that happened is that we uh, measured that the universe was expanding, uh, accelerating in its expansion. And that introduced dark energy and dark matter. Um, you, in your book, The Third Thoughts, you have an essay in the Art of Discovery essay. You write, discovery in science depends indispensably on an interaction between theory and experiment. And in Uses of Astronomy, another uh, uh, piece, you write, the explanation of the dark energy is now the deepest problem facing elementary particle physics. So I wanted to ask both of you actually, why is this problem so deep and how might experiment help? Andy? Well, um, it's deep because um, uh, we really have tried very hard and can't explain it. And it's particularly puzzling, or maybe I could explain what the problem is. Um, you know, there's in the, as uh, Steve writes in, in, um, in, in the book, um, you can calculate how much dark energy there should be in the universe just generated by uh, effects of the known particles in the standard models, electrons, uh, muons, and so on. And they create a huge amount of dark energy which we don't see. And so we have to cancel it by hand and we have to cancel it. And following Steve, I won't use exponentials. We have to, he refuses to use exponentials in his book. We have to cancel it to one part at a trillion, 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 trillion. We really have to cancel it. 56 decimal places. 56 decimal places, right. And it's so weird. Um, and there's no explanation for it. And uh, what's particularly bothersome about it, I would say, is that we can't, it's about, it's something that happens at long distances. We're used to the idea that there are things that we don't understand at short distances. You know, we, for a long time, we didn't understand, uh, you know, what the proton was made of. And eventually uh, we got bigger and better accelerators and we smashed them apart and we looked at their innards and we saw what they were made of and we've been making bigger and bigger accelerators that tell us more and more about smaller and smaller things. But this is something that is happening at huge distance scales. And um, the, so no, accelerators is going to help us. I don't know what the experiment is uh, that's going to help us. Um, in my mind, there was, uh, you know, in my assessment of this problem, and people have very different views of it, um, there's really been only one interesting paper written, and that was both one of Steve's greatest papers, but surely his most annoying paper, <laughs> <laughs> in which he, in, before the tiny value of the cosmological constant was measured, he wrote a paper in which he said he used anthropic reasoning. Um, and the, basis, the basic idea of anthropic reasoning is that we can explain this small value of the cosmological constant um, because if it weren't so small, the universe would not have room for life. And Steve made this semi-quantitative. And then he made a prediction based on this anthropic principle um, that the cosmological constant would soon be discovered. And it was. Now, uh, physicists hate this kind of reasoning because it puts us out of business. Uh, I understand that there was a time when the periodic table of elements was explained using the anthropic principle. If the elements, well, were, not, if the elements were not exactly 
what they uh, take exactly the pattern that they do, we wouldn't be able to have life. Now that didn't last very long because um, we got a much better spectacular uh, description of it. And so nobody bothers with that. So the anthropic principle, um, you know, it, it puts us out of business and it's very unsatisfying and we'll never be sure if it's the right answer. And so uh, it's, um, so, but of course the hallmark of good physical reasoning is that you can use it to make a prediction for an experiment which has not yet been done. It's very important that Steve said that before it was measured. If he'd said it after it was measured, we'd have all thought he cooked the books to make his reasoning match with experiment. But he said it before it was measured and then it, and then it, was, uh, and then it was measured. And so we might have to live with the anthropic principle, but um, I don't think we'll have another prediction coming from the anthropic principle. Well, it's um, not a prediction, but there is an experimental test. Um, if, if this is the explanation, you would expect the dark energy, that is the amount of energy per quart of space, uh, to be constant. And uh, on the other hand, maybe it's small because the universe is old and it's gradually getting smaller. We don't have any theory that looks like that, but you can, you can at least talk about that. Uh, so it is possible to tell astronomically whether the dark energy is changing. And there are large programs of observation uh, that aim at just this question. One of them is being carried out at the McDonald Observatory in West Texas, but there are others also, maybe even further along, uh, to measure uh, redshifts and dis redshifts meaning velocities of things moving away from us and distances of those things of la very large numbers of bodies, galaxies or whatever. And um, this, um, th this in principle can tell us whether the dark energy is changing. My guess based on the anthropic business is that uh, it's not changing. If it is changing, I would say the anthropic idea is just as wrong. Uh, so this is falsifiable. Uh, but if it's not changing, it doesn't prove that it's right. I have to acknowledge that. Um, Andy said that some people hate this. Well, David Gross, a very distinguished particle physicist, has said in so many words, I hate this idea. Um, and I hate it too. I would much rather be able to calculate it rather than have fuzzy order of magnitude guesses based on anthropic reasoning. But there is one context in which anthropic reasoning is not only possible, but is inevitable. And that is what's called the multiverse. That is perhaps uh, some picture like Andre Lindy's chaotic cosmology is correct. And the universe uh, in the very early times breaks up into separate, separate expanding bubbles. And in most of them, uh, the vacuum energy, the dark energy is, is large, positive or negative. They either wish out instantly or immediately recollapse. Uh, every once in a while, one of these has a small, because of cancellations that Andy mentioned, has a small vacuum energy and it manages to expand. And some of them even expand long enough for life to arise. Um, and naturally any astronomer who studies the dark energy will be in one of those rare parts of the multiverse because in all the other parts, there ain't anyone around. Um, but will so, we ever really know that Andre's theory or some other theory is, is correct? If I mean, wouldn't wouldn't really nailing it? We weren't in well, physics, we're not sure of things until we see them. We didn't I would really say, 
I would say uh, I don't quite agree with that. I mean, that's a kind of ultra positivist view. You know, uh, from most of modern astronomy, we've been convinced that the moon is a sphere and that it has a backside which is um, completes the sphere. Nobody saw it. It fit our theories. And then they, we managed to get astronauts going around the moon. And sure enough, it is a sphere. Um, you don't. You don't test things. I would say if a theory works, it, and it works in the sense that it's been very well tested in a lot of different contexts, you can believe it in other contexts. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, I believe quantum chromodynamics, which is the modern theory of strong forces, even though I, no experimentalist has ever seen a quark, uh, because uh, it makes predictions that work, in, including predictions that in certain kinds of collisions, you get sprays of particles that behave as if there's a quark inside. Um, I, uh, I think we might have a good theory of the early universe, which is tested in the way these theories get tested by looking at the inhomogeneities and the cosmic microwave background. And um, it may, for example, explain the mysterious fact that there's slightly more matter than antimatter in the early universe, which has survived to be the basis of what we, you know, planets and stars and so on today. We may have a theory that make successful predictions of all of these things. And if it also predicts a multiverse, I'll believe a multiverse. Um, it doesn't, I, even though I will never see the other parts of the multiverse, I don't, I don't have to see everything, just like I didn't have to see the other side of the moon. You know, Andy, you gave a historical um, instance of anthropic reasoning uh, which turned out to be wrong. Um, and that was um, uh, the periodic table. But there's an older historic example, which turned out to be right. Uh, Galen, the Roman physician, explained the distance between the earth and the sun, saying that the, if they were much closer, the earth would be too hot for life. And if they were much further, farther apart, then the earth would be too cold for life. And uh, that, he had a va vague idea of a benevolent creator, but in fact, that argument makes perfect sense because as we now know, Galen didn't know, there are billions and billions of planets mm -hmm. at all different distances from their parent stars. So mm -hmm. naturally on a small minority of them, the conditions are right for life. And naturally, any astronomer would be on one of those planets. I think that's a perfect analogy to uh, the anthropic explanation of the dark energy, except we don't know that there are many, many expanding bubbles, like in Lindy's chaotic cosmology or some other theory I, of the multiverse. I agree with you, like, that seeing the other side of the moon um, is not necessary to believe that it's there in some circumstances. But the amount of precision that you would have to have about the laws of physics and the, the way before the first one one hundredth of the second and the inflationary period in order to speak with confidence that the origin of the universe involved many bubbles uh, we're so far from that, that um, from that kind of understanding of what really the structure of the universe is at that time and at that scales, that um, it seems to me not such an interesting uh, discussion. Well, uh, one wouldn't want to spend one's life on it because many you... people do. As you suggested, progress is going to be slow, but I don't think it's, um, it's yeah. a hopeless task. And look what we've accomplished so far. 
uh, I couldn't have dreamed when I was a graduate student that we would have a scenario for the expansion of the universe, the one that I described in this book. Uh, it is incredible. You, which allowed you actually to calculate the abundance of helium and deuterium with which stars start their lives. And yet it works. Um, yeah. And then not only that, we have a theory of an even earlier period, uh, the theory initiated by Alan Guth at MIT that um, uh, the so-called uh, inflation theory, which makes predictions about the uh, distribution of inhomogeneities in the microwave background, and they also work, although I can't say that inflation is that well established because conceivably other theories could, I mean, it, it isn't the kind of precise numerical prediction that uh, convinces you the theory has to be right, but it certainly uh, is a step in that direction. Um, I talked, you know, earlier I mentioned a wisecrack. The, the wisecrack I, I made was on a conference on the multiverse, which um, I've always been proud of this. Um, this was a conference where um, uh, we met in Trinity College, Cambridge, in the Master's Lodge with a portrait of Isaac Newton looking down disapprovingly on us. And the discussion was the multiverse and should we take seriously the multiverse? And uh, Andre Lindy said he would bet his, he, did, he didn't say this at this meeting, but he had said it earlier and I quoted him in a talk I was given. He had said that uh, he would bet his life on the multiverse. And Martin Reese said he would bet the life of his dog. <laughs> and I, I topped this. I said, the ex to the extent that I believe in the multiverse, I would bet the lives of both Andre Lindy and Martin Reese's dog. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's my thing. That's, a, <laughs> that's about where I stand on it too. I've been to it. So, so one one thing, Steve, 